Hello YouTube, I thought it'd be fun to do a video about power bands, excitement, and engines, uh, torque, horsepower, turbos, naturally aspirated stuff, kind of how it all relates to each other, and how it relates to a drift car, how it relates to tire wear, how it relates to a rampy wee feeling as you get into boost and things like that. What makes drift cars exciting or boring or all these different things. So let's get started. First of all, this is a dyno graph thing. There's nothing plotted on it yet, but we're going to talk about that. And torque and horsepower always meet right over here at 5,250 um, because torque and horsepower related. Horsepower is torque over time. And we'll kind of just chat about all this stuff. So let's see, and I didn't even make it more than 400 horsepower, but in 10,000 RPM. I've never had an engine that really went there for more than one second. All right, let's get started. So first of all, I'm going to draw a power band and we're going to talk about average horsepower over time how that relates to like a drift car, what makes a good drift car out of that, a bad drift car, or an exciting one and a boring one. So very first, I'm gonna draw a terrible power band. And that's going to be horsepower being really low and then ramping up all at once. Now, this car would be incredibly slow even if it made a thousand horsepower. Um, it would be super dependent upon gearing the transmission. It would fall out of power constantly. And this would be a terrible driver's car because it would only make, it would really only make usable power for like a thousand RPM. And I have driven cars like this. So we end up with a terrible power band that's very, very small and unusable, even though this car could make a thousand horsepower. Um, you could make this work in some type of crazy F1 situation or something with a crazy transmission that shifted super fast and all these different things. But we, what we want to do is to create a situation where we make a lot of power all the time um, and then balance that with fun and longevity and all these different things and talk about how to get there. So one of the terrible things about this, by the way, it's going to take me a while because I didn't script this or anything to get through this. <clears throat> one of the terrible things about this is terrible tiny power band. But one of the good things about this is this motor, when it came on, would feel crazy exciting. And that's because it gives you nothing and makes you like build anticipation and get ready for the power. And then it hits all at once. So if you were shifting at eight and then making like a little second or two of lag, and then you would jump into the power band, you would have to be at a crazy high RPM. So the thing would be audibly very exciting. You would have that ramp up of say, you know, 400 horsepower or something like that within a thousand RPM. Now the top car would spin the tires and it would be a mess and it would be uncontrollable because of the way the power came in so quickly, but it would be a really exciting feeling and it would give you the feeling of, oh my God, this thing is uncontrollable and so fast. Because one of the easiest things to do to make a car feel fast is to take away grip in the rear. Um, and you can do that by adding air pressure tire, like air pressure to the rear tires. You can do it with crappier rear tires, smaller rear tires. Basically, you can take away the grip without increasing horsepower. Um, we have a saying, air pressure is free horsepower, basically. So why add horsepower and do that stuff when you use up air pressure at the events? Um, but yeah, so this would be an incredibly exciting power band, but it would be terrible. But you would go wee all the way through here and you would feel the car accelerate at an increasing pace. So instead of the car accelerating at the exact same pace, like your pickup truck or something, it would go one take off. And that would be extremely exciting, but a terrible power band and awful for drifting. This car literally would not drift. And I have seen somebody with a power band like this. Taka back in Formula D, he had this Hasselgren motor. It was of like a Toyota Atlantic uh, 4AGE and made 300 horsepower naturally aspirated at like 10,000 RPM. I don't think they always ran it at those higher RPMs because it would destroy the motor. So he had an even smaller power band that was worse. And that thing literally could barely do a burnout, but it was like triple the stock horsepower. It was such a mess because the thing never made usable torque and everything. It was never in the power band and Corollas are difficult to do that stuff with anyways. All right, now let's swap. This car's an LS car, by the way. Let's swap to an LS power band now. Um, the horsepower on an LS power band is very linear and the torque would look something like, obviously not at 1000, but I'm just drawing something simple. The torque might look something like that. And what that means is, is as you accelerate, the rate of acceleration is very constant. So the car is not going to pull harder and harder and harder, the higher in the RPM you go, it's, you're going to floor it. And it's going to feel like a linear steady state of acceleration. Um, that means it's going to feel boring 
potentially, depending on like if you can spin the tires and how everything works, a very powerful V8 is still going to be very exciting to drive, but it's going to give you a different factor. It's going to be incredibly competent and it's going to make power all the time, huge power band, and it's going to feel super healthy. Um, and say you are full throttle and then you shift and then full throttle and then shift, full throttle and then shift. If every three seconds or four seconds you shift, with this really bad power band, you would only be in the power band for like say one second out of every four. Um, meaning the car would lag, 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 and then make power and then you would shift. Uh, whereas this thing would be in power the entire time you're in gear and then you would shift. So this car would be putting down um, say three times the amount of time of power. And then also for that time, it's always putting down way more. Um, and then here, you're still putting down more even up there, except at that last split second. But people would say potentially the LS is like a boring engine. Um, and that, that could be true in some ways. I personally love that because it's incredibly competent to drive and compete in. Now let's show you the ultimate boring car, which is like a VQ, which might make, I don't know, 230 foot pounds of torque. If you ever look at their dyno sheets, it literally is just like a line and then like eventually dies off somewhere. Obviously it's not going to go to 10, but it's probably going to die off and go somewhere to eight in some of the uh, HR motors. You might only make 190 wheel torque, something like that out there, who knows, at the wheels and 230 or something like that through here. And then the horsepower on that is probably just going to look like a straight line with a tuned one up until about 8,000 RPM. It's probably only going to make about 310 wheel or 300 wheel. It's not going to be crazy exciting always a steady linear rate of acceleration. But anytime you get back on that gas, it's always providing the exact same amount of torque, basically regardless of where you are. And then you're multiplying that with gearing. Say you're in third gear, <clears throat> could feel really bogged out. You go down a second, feels way peppier. You're still putting down a similar amount of torque through the engine, but through gearing, it feels way better. And then if you can rev that thing to 8,000, you can stay in second gear on a track where a DE one or somebody else might have to be in third. So this car would be insanely competent, but boring as it never ramps up in power. And then also <clears throat> you would even be shifting it less than a normal car, which would make it way easier to drive, create less problems on track for shifting and missing shifts or anything else. Cause that's when you crash, um, you know, like in tandem, you'll miss a shift and the guy will slam into you. Um, but it's going to be an incredibly competent car, but it's going to be a bit of a, like boring car potentially from a power band perspective. Now that's kind of funny though, because you'll see in whatchamacallit in Texas street legal that these cars are literally the podium. Like four of the cars on the podium are 350 Z's most of the time. They kind of just trash all the other cars for lots of different reasons, mostly because there's four times as many of them as any other car, maybe more, but the power band is so competent. They're not having issues with losing because they're miss shifting losing because they fall out of boost, losing because of all these different reasons. And then also we have amazing drivers loaded up on those cars. So that's, that's the thing. All right, now let's draw a competent like turbo car. <clears throat> and we'll talk about like, say there's a lot of guys like James Dean that run turbo two JZs. Um, and then they create a flat power band by adding nitrous. So they'll take a very exciting motor and then it's not competent enough for competition necessarily. So they will add nitrous below boost to I'll show you real quick. So a uh, 2JZ for competition use will probably come on somewhere around 5,000 RPM. The torque would do something like nothing, 200 or something. And then it would start ramping in hard right there. And then it would come and then choke out and then maybe up to nine or something, let's say. Might look something like that for the torque and come down. And then the horsepower, I'm just randomly drawing something, would probably be even lower and then around 5,000 might take off and the horsepower goes up like that. Um, obviously it, it would be at higher numbers than 400 as well. This might be like six or 700 for a Formula D motor. And this means that they have to drive and keep that car. Now this thing ramps in really fast between four and five. And in a drift car, you can keep the car above 5,000 RPM, especially in a competition setting and everything. And this is totally workable. You're not so worried about excitement in Formula D from the power band perspective. In fact, the worse power band and the more exciting it is, the worse it would be in competition. 
but it's gonna create amazing noise with that inline six and everything. It's gonna ramp up hard, make tons of torque, which can be, which can be hard to do in a naturally aspirated V8. So the Jay-Z's actually make more torque, but probably for less of the time. Um, and this is gonna be really cool. Now, the thing that makes it exciting is you're raising up probably 400 wheel torque within a 1000 RPM range. So you feel the car ramp up and go wee really fast. And then it's going to die off and choke off because it's a turbo motor and you probably hit the exhaust housing limit or whatever the limit of the car is. And then the horsepower is going to keep going and like probably flatten off at some point. And then you kill it probably in one of those things by 9,000 RPM. Now that gives you on turbo cars, you're lucky to ever get say 3,500 RPM of power band out of a turbo car. One, two, three. So probably the power band is right in here, the meat of it. Um, which is a, a pretty good like competition type power band. And then to get the thing, cause if you get back on the gas, that large turbo could always take a certain amount of time to spool back up um, because the blades might be down to 10,000 RPM or something. You have to get back to hundred thousand RPM. Just takes time to move all that stuff, especially on the bigger turbo wheels. So they're gonna use nitrous to fill in this area, let's say from four to five or three to five and try and shoot 150 shot or something like that to move the power band over this much and fill that out more. Um, so even with an exciting turbo power band and everything else in a competition setting, a lot of the times they're trying to replicate like the larger power band of the V8 um, by moving the power band over with nitrous. And in drag racing, they spray the nitrous on the top end most of the time over here but in drifting, you're gonna spray it on the bottom end to have a more usable power band with these larger turbo cars. Uh, kind of an interesting thing to do. So they probably, I don't know what they're gonna do, but they're probably gonna either taper down the shot or just turn it off after a certain point, depending on the drivability of the car. Um, and you get a turbo car that's super exciting, that can make more torque production than a naturally aspirated V8, um, and a crazy power band, because they're putting so much grip into those cars that they want stuff like this. Um, and you're band-aiding a turbo car with nitrous or with a larger displacement bottom end going from 2.5 up to three or 3.4, 3.6 liters in a Jay-Z um, and creating a power band like that. So that's taking a, whatchamacallit, a very exciting car and then band-aiding it so that you have a more like V8 power band where you get on the fuel, the gas and it responds. So cool. And then let's chat real quick about like big cam cars. Um, say you have a LS and LSs are a bad example because as you add power to an LS, it kind of adds it everywhere. But some cars say like an S2000, I don't know what they look like, but they probably look like something like that for torque, except they don't make that much torque. Um, as you would add a larger camshaft, you would, add some power over here and you would take away power all through here so you might end up with some power band like that shift and that means in an s2000 which already has a really big camshaft i don't know anything about s2000s i'm just guessing you could say it 4ag or whatever you're typically going to be giving up low end power to add high end power over here which means if you're not above 6000 rpm the car is actually slower on the street everywhere than over here. So you have to be shifting at six to eight or something like that. And you can even do this in uh, very large cammed V8s and stuff like that, where you give up power band. Now, most of the time in the LS configuration, you're just gaining power everywhere with a big cam. So those are kind of cheating. And then I kind of want to say like, something about Japanese cars is people think well, first of all, before we get there, I personally think LS cars are really exciting to drive, not stock ones. I just bought two LS cars behind me and I hadn't driven a stock one in a long time. Power Blend is extremely fat, flat and the torque does something like this and just like goes like truck motor status. And it's actually the opposite of what exciting is. As you go faster, the torque is falling down. So the car almost feels slower, which means you need to shift and like drive it from two to say 4,500 or five. That is the exact opposite of an exa exciting power band. You'd rather the torque do something like that because you want the car 
on an upward trajectory to create excitement and enjoyment in the car, car's power band. So you just have to be kind of careful of all that, if that makes sense. And you can't say a stock LS1 revs are like 6,200 or something like that. Even if you extended, because I rev my LSs out to 7,500, you would be on a downward slope and you would gain a gearing advantage where you might not have to shift up to third on entry and then back down a second. You could stay in second the entire time, but the car would be really flat through there and be getting slower the longer you stay in gear. So it's the exact opposite of exciting. Kind of just something to keep in mind. So you want the torque somewhat flat or maybe increasing, but the stock LS1 power actually decreases and that's why everybody says they're not exciting at all. And then let me draw an example of some SR stuff real quickly. This would apply to Jay-Z with like a stock turbo and then a mild turbo and then a bigger turbo. But let's talk about that real quickly. Uh, let's say a stock, stock SR makes, I don't know, 220 foot pounds or 240 foot pounds or something like that. It's real dead. And then it kind of comes on by three and then kind of flattens out and comes down and dies off. A stock SR car is probably in the mid 100s of torque through here. It also wants to be driven a little bit more exciting than a, a V8 car. Um, and this is torque, of course. But since you're shifting at, say, 2,500 on the street and then shifting and probably just like, you know, out to five or six, but you're in the meat of the power band a lot, you're constantly driving this car around in traffic right in its torque surge. And that feels really cool. And then if you take this stock same turbo and you add like an intake and exhaust, um, you get some more like excitement from hearing it. But as you add more boost to, because this car might have been like seven PSI from the factory. And then as you ramp up more boost and you go to a bar, the car comes over and then dies off on the same type of power band or something like that, or maybe carries it a little bit farther. But suddenly you're at 14 PSI. And the reason that feels so good and so exciting is you ramp that power up at a steeper curve. Um, so you're doing the exact same thing as here, but you ramp it up and you're always in this meaty power band. So if you can keep the car in that same power band, it's gonna feel amazing because you're on the street, you're shifting for those numbers. That makes an amazing street car. And then if we're on the track a lot, you can move your power bands from say 3.5 to four-ish, somewhere right in here. And then that's gonna get you over here to that number. And that is going to look like probably, it's gonna be way slower down low. And this would be like a, say a 2871 turbo. And then it's gonna ramp up and then it's gonna do the same thing and start dying off. But on a larger turbo, you're going to feel more lag. So from two to four, you're actually that much less horsepower. So the car is actually slower throughout there. And then it ramps up harder and feels more acceleration in a shorter time period and feels more exciting and then tapers off because of whatever limitation, the head or exhaust housing, whatever you have, you're eventually gonna find it and then you're gonna come back down. Um, and then if you were to take an SR and try and get to a 9,000 RPM power band, you're gonna need a huge turbo that's really laggy through here, maybe comes on at five, comes up dumb hard, and then you're obviously gonna wanna make like five or 600 horsepower and then comes down. And that's the only way you can get up here to that power band. Otherwise you're so choked out up here, you're making a hundred foot pounds of torque on these other turbos in this area or something like that. Um, and then obviously the huge turbo car is gonna feel huge excitement through there. But if you're driving it on the street, this thing is slower than a 4AG Corolla throughout the power band until you say get to five, which gets very frustrating. And especially in drift, you can drive an 800 horsepower SR car. And if it's kind of laggy or doesn't have nitrous or whatever it is to spool this thing up, it is going to be crazy bad power band. And I mean, like I can't even explain to you the frustration of driving a car with hundred foot pounds of torque at 4,000 RPM. Uh, they'll, they'll fix this with crazy high gearing. They'll fix it with a sequential transmission. They'll fix it with nitrous, um, whatever it is that they can keep the car in this power band or extend the power band this way. All right, so now the next thing I wanna talk about real quickly is how to create a good power band and all that stuff in these cars. With an LS motor, everything that you're gonna do for the most part is going to make it better um, to a point. If you put too much of a cam in it, it's probably gonna lope and drive shitty. If you're gonna put huge heads on it, there's probably not a big downside to that. If you're gonna add displacement, you're gonna pick up power everywhere. 
the power band could actually get more boring because the LS car then would torque, like if a normal LS car is like this, and then if you add more displacement, it might come up and then choke off on the same restriction in the motor, which would be the heads or whatever. So it might even create a more boring power band, but man, would it be a good power band, but like extra boring. Um, obviously it would be at way higher numbers too. Um, my Stroker LS3 makes like 535 torque, I think, but it has a similar type of power band um, direction as that, but it is amazing to drive. So cool. What you want to do for the most part is choose what you're doing. If you're racing, you can be say four to seven or whatever you want to do. If you want to be um, a street car, probably a nice power band is anywhere from two to like 3,500 um, up to whatever you want it to be. Probably not crazy high. Um, if you want an exciting power band, you want it to ramp up. If you want a boring power band, you want it to be pretty flat on torque. Um, if you want a car that doesn't require as much maintenance, you want an engine that's unstressed. 350Z naturally aspirated engine is very unstressed and is gonna last forever. A really fun turbo car that ramps up hard and torque is probably going to see a lot of stress in this area. And it's going to be much more susceptible to braking because you're ramping things up really hard. And then if you're gonna try and make a lot of RPM, you're gonna create a lot of stress in the head um, and other parts of the engine. And you just start to get all these different things. So you have to try and think about what do you want out of an engine? What do you want your power band to be? How exciting do you want it to be? What fuel do you want it to run on? And you make all these adjustments in your head. And then let's talk real quickly about getting off the line and stuff. Now, we had an event and one of our drivers is JR and he has this beautiful S13. It was Alexi's favorite car at the event from Noriaro Channel. And it probably, I think he said he has a 2867 with a large hot side. So the car probably makes 100 foot pounds of torque or something. And then right around 4,000 RPM, it probably comes up here to 400 horsepower or something like that, let's say. And then probably dies off real hard there. And he was having trouble getting off the line because he'd be in first gear. And I think he has a Z32 transmission. So at some point you have to get off the line and you need to get to that first 4,000 RPM um, so he can get into his power band. He lags out really bad there and the car in front of him jumps him. Now he can try and do something where he clutch kicks off the line kind of thing, dumps the clutch and is already up in that power band, but the car is probably gonna spin the tires. So he wants to ride this torque curve up, not start at 400 foot pounds of torque because that'll spin the tires. He probably needs to start somewhere down here, you know what I mean? Somewhere in here, and that can be really hard to do. So his, his first shift, he probably gets off the line and loses a full two car lengths to the person or car length, unless he jumps them off the line, which is also a possibility. And then on his one, two shift, it's, there's normally a pretty big spacing, but er, no, I guess there's a short spacing between those. And he's probably going to fall to like, say 3,500, or if he revs it all the way out, he might, you know, fall from seven down to six. And then he just keeps having this problem of every time he shifts a gear, the car ramps up really fast into boost. Um, and makes a difference of 200 foot pounds to 400 foot pounds within, uh, depending on the quality of your turbo and stuff and like the bearings center section and stuff, um, maybe within half a second or one second or sometimes on laggy cars, a couple seconds. And then the other car is going to either, he's gonna pull on them if he can stick the tires or the car is going to break free of the tires because it's accelerating too fast and ramping up the wheel speed. And then that guy's gonna get away. And then as he gets up into the higher gears, the car is then going to be able to um, utilize the torque because instead of happening in one second, getting from there to there, it's going to make this in fourth gear, it's going to take four seconds to rip through that gear or three seconds. So suddenly this was taking one second in first, let's just say two to three seconds in second or something like that. And by the time you get to fourth, you're there for multiple seconds, which means the car is not raising so fast. And then also it can stick the power so then once you get to fourth, the, the power band is not a problem, but in the first few gears it is, um, and whatever. And you can't, by the way, necessarily backpedal on that and get off the gas because then you'll lose boost and like, it'll be a constant problem of ramping up and the turbo spinning and or like surging and doing all these things. Whereas let's say an LS1 
or like a perfect power band, let's say 400 horsepower against JR. It makes all the power you want and you control that with your foot pedal. So if I leave the line and I want 200 foot pounds of torque and over the first uh, three or four seconds, I wanna to get to 7,000 RPM, I can bring my torque in in a linear fashion and make sure I don't have a problem um, spinning the tires or doing anything else. And I can do that by throttle position with my foot a lot better than a turbo car because a turbo car, even at 10% throttle or 20% throttle could surge and still do that torque curve. But like this, the torque curve is controllable by me and I can make sure it's in a linear fashion. And I could do this over say three seconds. Or if I'm starting to spin the tires, I could do it over four seconds. Or if I have all the grip in the world, I could try and do this in the shortest period of time, which might be in the first two gears, let's say, or first gear or something like that, two seconds. So I can adjust my throttle and get the torque I want, which can be very difficult out of a turbo engine, unless you build something with nitrous and everything else. And then you have a very, a much more like, um, what do you call? Like uh, precise power band that you can put down. Now, sometimes this can be worse because you could make so much torque in a V8 that any amount of throttle input, especially with a turbo V8 or something, is just gonna light those tires off because the dang thing is gonna make so much torque I don't know, it has to come up sometime. But it's gonna make so much torque that it's almost uncontrollable and violent and difficult to manage. And that's a problem. Meaning, even if you're at a low, like say you had a turbo V8, even at say 20% throttle, you could be surging that turbo and making crazy torque. And that could be a problem. The linearness of a like naturally aspirated could be a really good thing. Problem is, is naturally aspirated horsepower can be very expensive. All right, closing thought real quick. So this video doesn't get too long. Um, when you're building a car and you're trying to create excitement or you're trying to build a competent competition car, I've kind of already laid that stuff out. However, when you take a car and an engine and you want to modify it, most of the time you cannot modify a performance car to have better characteristics, maybe like more defined for like your purpose, but the engineers do a really good job. Say with an LS1, at that time period, they created an incredible power band that all you can do is shift it around left or right on the dyno sheet um, with parts. Same thing with like an SR at the time. You couldn't really make that car better than the engineers could at the time. And like right now with an S58, like say BMW M3 motor, it's really hard to make that car better. You could make it have more peak power. Um, I'm not just talking about free tuning gains. I'm talking about like changing parts. You could make the car maybe have more peak power, but you're gonna destroy the power band on the bottom and you're just gonna shift things around. The only way you get a free lunch in modifying cars most of the time is to use like more technology that comes in over time. So like 10 to 15 years after the LS was developed and aftermarket came out and they made more technologically advanced parts. And then by the time you get to the LS3, the LS3 intake manifold heads and bottom end and stuff are so good, it's hard to beat them. Those like LS3 heads flow something like 650 to 700 crank. Um, so you can take modern technology and apply it to old engines, or you could just go get a newer engine package as well until there's the problem of like, how do you make some of this direct injection stuff even run? Um, so you could also go back and take an SR now. And now that we have better turbos and better injectors and all this stuff and better ECUs, you can go and you could put a Garrett G30 660 on it or something like that and have a really good power band, or even just say like, whatever the G25 is, you could have the same power band as a stock turbo or near to it, but with more peak power and more power everywhere because you have a better turbo that's 30 years newer than that old turbo. But if you took a T25 or a T28, because T28 is really good actually, T25 is kind of small, and you were to use turbos from the 1980s or like 90s when that thing was developed, it's kind of hard to create a better power band that's larger than those other turbos. You're just moving it around. Um, the only free lunch you get most of the time is adding displacement or adding really expensive fuels. So you can kind of get away with trickery. Um, but I would say most of the time, stay away from fancy fuels. Adding displacement is really cool and it is a free lunch most of the time. Also adding boost a lot of the time and increasing the danger zone of what you're doing, whether it be a T25, a CT15 off a of 1J or anything else. 
that's the biggest free lunch you can get is just opening up the exhaust and adding more boost or something like that. But once you start changing turbo sizes and stuff, typically you make the car worse in a lot of ways, maybe a little bit better in some, but worse in other ways. And you're just starting to make a ton of trades. Hmm. That's a big thing. I just kind of the takeaway of like, go make an exciting car, make a competent car, make whatever you want, but understand what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you can ruin a car so easily by either just straight piping a car and making it way too abusively loud and ruining it to picking up no horsepower, or you could go get a boost controller on a factory like Jay-Z that runs a very low boost or SR, almost double the power or the boost of the car, make way more power, especially with like a freer flowing exhaust and get somewhat of a free lunch. Oh, I have one more other last thought. There's something to talk about like American cars versus Japanese cars and all these other things. Um, I was thinking about a lot of people think maybe like the Japanese cars were super exciting and they made them that way. The two liter, 2.5, three liter type of thing. I think the Japanese probably would have put larger displacement engines in cars had it not been for their tax structure, forcing them to have like two, 2.5 and like all that kind of stuff. So one Jay-Z's were 2.5, not because necessarily that was the perfect engine size. Maybe it is though was because it fit the rules so they could get under a tax thing. And then the, the two Jay-Z was set at the absolute limit of the three liter rule. And then the RB20 was two liters, the RB25 was 2.5, and then the 26 didn't really take advantage of the full like bump and displacement up to, they only went to 2.6. Um, but it gives you an idea of the Japanese even wanted to increase displacement as much as they could get away with, but then they were limited by the displacement stuff and they came up with really cool turbo technologies to create really exciting cars. And we're kind of in that era right now. The more the government restricts the size of the engines, the emissions and everything else, the more by a byproduct, which is hilarious, is we're getting these absolutely ridiculous engines like the new M2 and M3, M4, S58. That's a BMW platform. They make like almost 700 wheel with a tune, maybe down pipes, I don't know but I think they make 650 wheel just with a tune. So as they regulate this stuff, you get some really wacky, crazy stuff because they have to do so much to get around emissions. Um, cool, I think that's about all I really wanted to talk about. Cool, we power bands, all this stuff. You can make decisions. I kind of just kind of armed you with my thought process of how stuff works and why things work and how you want fast torque ramp rate for we power, how you want flat for competition use, how you wanna do wheel speed ramp up and all these different things. If you do have a tiny power band, you need shorter gears to blast through it. I didn't really touch on that, but that's a thing. If you have a V8 like mine with a very broad power band, I can gear my car to basically use just first and second or maybe second and third or whatever through some tracks or basically just second at Houston Police Academy. And you ride out the torque band of that engine and utilize it, meaning I don't have to shift and I have an easier time winning battles that way. Whereas before, when I, when I had a 410 instead of a 3.5 ring gear, I would have to oftentimes make the 4.3 shift at tracks and I would mess up that 4.3 shift and I needed a dog box or something so I didn't have to go through that. Um, and I would hit fifth and then almost crash the car. And that's a pretty common thing with T56s having to shift a lot. Or I could just limit the amount of times I shift and make sure I'm always in third gear at those tracks or always in second or just up to third and then I don't have to downshift. Or if you do downshift, it's down to second and you can hit that gate and then pull down. So it's a much safer shift. Or you can get a quick change rear end or a sequential or a dog box or whatever else. That's it. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it, everybody. Bye.